The Geneva Reading Series. Nostalgia. According to Christianity Today, the loneliest time of the year is Christmas. According to Harry Nilsson via Three Dog Night, numbers can be lonely too. The loneliest number is the number one. According to Relevant Magazine, nine can be as bad as one. It's the loneliest number since the formation of the Confederated Writers of the lovely, opportunistically nostalgic, educational, lovesome, yummy squad. A.K.A. the Lonely Squad. Sometimes shortened to the N.Y., the nostalgic yummies. In the 1970s, nine writers united and moved from Minas Morgul at the feet of the Mountains of Shadow in eastern Mordor, Virginia. <laughs> to Grand Rapids, Michigan, home of Bernie and Pat Zondervan, brother lords of the Zondervan's publishing inspirational life-giving empire. <laughs> Since then, these scribbling nine of the nostalgic yummy squad have been killing us softly with a friendly fire in the form of the Christian romance novel genre. <laughs> the author's names are written on the tongues of more than six cats per household and dogs caught wearing sweaters. Thus, you cannot read them. There are few who can. The language is that of Mordor, Virginia. <laughs> which I will not utter here. In the common tongue, their names are Lori Wick, Mary Connolly, Janet Oak, Karen Whitemire, D. Henderson, Francine Rivers, Grace Livington Hill, Laura Elizabeth Ingalls Wilder, and John, son of John, son of Zebulon, none other than John Boy Walton. They, the Nine, have held sway over the emotional lives of our brothers and sisters for far too long. Tonight, I will tell you a romance. Yes, a choose-your-own-adventure tale of romance and realism. It is a tale to end tales, and by that I mean in part to stop people from calling stories tales, and to stop them from putting Shire on the end of every place name, and Warwick at the beginning, and to stop the immigration of hauntingly attractive daughters of missionaries into 19th century westward flats of America, where lie in wait myriad widower rogues with brooding brows, ten children, and bulbous pectorals dancing beneath checkered shirts. Stop it. No more emotional hijacks. The novel equivalent of a chicken drowned in cheese, then rammed into the stomach of a duck who's been asphyxiated within the gastric passage of a turkey. Stop it, Wick, John Boy, you farmers of emotional turducken. Here's a feast to end the famine. Let's put the big pink elephant of loneliness in the room into the ground. I title my story, The Princess Sophie's Heart Whispers of Moonlight Where the Wild Rose Blooms Beneath Canopies of Bamboo and Lace When Calls the Heart to a Bride Most Begrudging Only When Love Comes Softly, colon. The measure of a lady made to match a preacher from the series Timber Ridge and Rocky Mountain Memories and Reflections by the Brides of Coldy Creek, the seven brides and daughters of Captain Kincaid, Canadian Kensington English Garden Secret Party Pants, book one. <laughs> Part one, The Howling Wilderness. I introduce our hero. I am Rig Ripton, make peace, make lick Lipston. Father of five girls and ten boys, all born at once out of a dead woman, <laughs> whom I shall never not love. I live in the worst place in the world, Del Mar, Nevada, 1909. I do not know what this accent that I have is, <laughs> only that I acquired it having worked 11 years on the quartz mines of Monkey Gulch. Named after Monkey Goats McGee, a crazy person who is dead and whose corpse did never rot in so dry and silicon infused a place as Monkey Goats Delmar. Gold I found in the quartz, refined it. Silicon dust I breathed, got poisoned. That is my accent. It is called silicon poison tongue. Sometimes I will sound southern. 
Sometimes I will sound like a linguistically calicoed moron. <laughs> Silicon. Thank you, Mr. McLick Lipston. Lipston lives down at the end of Blake Gubbler Road. His 15 audacious and beautiful children work on his sheep and goat farm, while he, for a mysterious reason, crawls down into the mines every day, hacking his way through the foundation stones of Nevada, looking for quartz in such a way that his body is hulking and bulbous with muscle. His body looks like a nest of pythons that swallowed a cabbage patch of bowling balls. <laughs> In the caverns where he labors every day, yes, for unknown reasons, there the sugary underworld dew seeps into his skin, and thus his sweat has become sweet nectar that the honeybees do suckle while he sleeps upon the bare ground beneath the stars every night, weeping tears from his ducts and said sweety nectar from his airtight poreholes. The bees hum his lament. For back, back in the deep recesses of his past lies a secret so dark, so very dark, that nary a maiden in Delmar dare say his name, Rig Ripton Mcpeas McClick Lipston, for fear of swoons and fainting fits. There he lies, let us leave him for now. Tossing and turning, making diamonds of the dust by rolling his heavy body upon the Nevada sands. <laughs> Our eyes now turn to Konoshima Island off the coast of Japan, where the lost tribe of the Brazada Ghouls live amongst the overrunning rabbits that fly over the jungle terrain. Their feet a thunder rumble as the herd stampede after prey, and there we find, in a tragic state, the missionary family, the Lambrights. Eli Swarton Truber Lambright and his wife, Naomi Ruth Merriam Marion Martha Lambright. <laughs> And their daughter, oh, their daughter, Eva Lustella Lambright, of dove-like eyes, teeth like sheep, her hair like goats. She is lithe as two gazelles running from a pack of less impressive gazelles. She is two Penelope Cruises running from a pack of Drew Barrymore's. Eva Lustella Lambright, adventurous, stubborn, extremely humble, midwife to a million rabbits, and professional warbler of Braza de Ghoul tribal songs. She sings sweetly o'er the greeny hills, haunting the de Ghouls with her beauty, her pearl-like beauty and purity, and the mysterious thing in the center of her head that longs for America. But wait, tragedy. Let us look now upon the Lambrights mourning for their lost daughter, carried away by a band of eunuch pirates who'd heard tell of a great goddess of the rabbits. Born out of the thunder of their feet, they found her, they stole her. If you decide to send the eunuch pirates along Magellan's run to sell Eva to the cannibalistic Wata Wata Abawa tribe, turn to page 19. <laughs> If you decide to send the pirates around the world to California to sail up the mysterious Del Mar River all the way to Del Mar, Nevada, and to die, every one of them but one, having given their bodies over to death by the exhaustion of incessant devotional singing, which is the dessert food of young Eva, then turn to page 19 and a half. <laughs> 19 and a half. 19 and a half. The Wata Wata Eberwa tribe. The eunuch pirates take Eva along Magellan's run to sell her to the cannibalistic Wata Wata Eberwa tribe. But Eva contracts ship biscuit fever and dies. And Cthulhu rises up and eats the ship and all the eunuchs. Try again. What? What? Nineteen and a half. Ah, the ship sails to Del Mar, Nevada. <laughs> Poor Eva, our defiant heroine. She is filled with amnesia by sunstroke. She only remembers her own name and a hundred thousand praise songs and the entire Bible and John Fox's Book of Martyrs as well as Pilgrim's Progress, which was tattooed onto the soles of her eyelids by the Praza de Gouls. <laughs> 
Eva, and the last surviving eunuch named Eunuch. <laughs> a deformed and tiny young man with lots of wisdom and no chance of ever being an actual romantic foil, stand on the shores of Del Mar in the dead of night. They see a light to the east and begin their journey over the desert sands. If you decide to make Eva march all night, turn to page 17. <laughs> if you decide to make Eva camp at the shores of Del Mar and wait until morning to travel, turn to page 16. 17. 17. What? Page 16, make her camp. <laughs> Eva sets up camp at the shores of Del Mar, intending to wait until morning to travel. During the night, she contracts water elf disease and swells up and dies. <laughs> And wolves rise up and eat the corpse and camp, and eunuch. 17? Se what? 17. Eva marches all night toward Del Mar, holding eunuch tightly in her arms and humming hymns. And somewhere out in the desert night, Rig Ripton make peace, McClick Lipston stirs in hidden diamond dreams. His lips move beneath the listening and loving galaxies. He murmurs with his ample lips down in the depths of his buttery beard. Those lips, the soft beak of an evil eagle of Avalon. Yes, he murmurs. Oh, I'll never tell my secret. My, my disastrous secret. The secret that gives the impression of a sinful past. A tantalizing secret. Before we meet Eva, let us give her a desert as it was, filled with wolves and menacing crickets and a dangerous strain of airborne biliousness, in addition to creaking cacti and moaning seminal winds, blowing like they're never gonna blow again, calling to you like a long-lost friend, though they don't know who you are. <laughs> so, in quadrant one, we need wolves. Wolves? <laughs> Whoa. Oh. And growls, various growls. Okay, remember. Quadrant two. We need crickets and creaking cacti. Remember. We need airborne biliousness, quadrant three, which sounds like gangla, 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 gangla. Perfect. Remember your rules. <laughs> All together. <laughs> Perfect. Unfortunately, we can't have a scary soundtrack. This is because of Zondervan's publishing house's top ten the answer is no list. <laughs> the list carefully lays out in alphabetical order everything you cannot include in one of their productions. The answer is no to the word bra. <laughs> Though you can say bra if you are referring to a garment worn by an obese boy or a woman over the age of 120. <laughs> Ifs and ands are fine, but no but or buttocks. You can say dairy air or backside, though it is not recommended. Crap is out, as is dag nabbit, duty, dang, darn, dern. Try blast instead. You can't say father when used to describe a religious official. No fiend, for heaven's sake, or Pete's, for the love of Mike. You cannot say gee, gosh, golly, Halloween, or harlot. <laughs> Sheesh is an acceptable replacement. The word heat is offensive. <laughs> no heck, holy cow, hot, haughty, no hunk. You can't say the word need or hunger when used to describe a non-food-focused state of being. <laughs> Nudity is repugnant. Even the nudity of animals is unacceptable, as it is <laughs> clearly a slippery slope. <laughs> Simply put bells on your donkeys and sweaters on your dogs and cats. <laughs> Don't say pee, poop, passion, or priest, or saint anyone. Don't curse or swear or promise anything by saying I swear. For example, I swear by the moon and the stars in the sky. And I swear like the shadow that's by your side. Shadows can't swear. They cannot even speak. <laughs> But your Christians, in moments of frustration and pain, can say fiddlesticks, <laughs> Great Scott, Merlin's Pants, Barbara Streisand. <laughs> Son of a Bucket. 
Fraggle Rock, Obesity and Bunions, Son of a Nutcracker, Sugar Babies, Avada Kedavra. Wait, no, that one is out and it must be burned. O Fish Hooks, Botox, Pigs in a Blanket, Dragon Ball Z, Justin Bieber! Since there is no good substitute for a scary soundtrack, what Zondervan's calls symphonic utterances that tempt us to fear and doubt, we need to have certain numbers of you chanting, run, no oh, Eva, run, run, no oh, Eva, run, run, oh, and it'll be quadrant four, you. Let's take a listen. Run, 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 run. Beautiful. Do we have wolves still? Do we have crickets and creaking cacti? Do we have airborne biliousness? <laughs> Chilling. <laughs> and once again, the scary soundtrack substitute. Run, 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 run. Wait for my signal. <laughs> On that dark night, Eva does not camp on the shores of Delmar and thus die by water elf disease, no. She runs to Delmar in the dark, dark. She takes up dainty eunuch in her arms tightly, and she says, Glorify your fancy feelings and let's run to the literal and natural As she runs, she wails. <laughs> and she sings melancholicy melodies, sad, repressed, but hopeful music. It starts with the wind, a call and response personification of nature that would make Walt Disney shriek with pangs of joy. The wind says, I don't know when, I don't know how, but I know something's starting right now. Someday I'll be, someday you'll be, <laughs> part of your world. The music soars a long distance. So far, the big Britain make peace, McLick Lipson begins to rise out of his hidden diamond dreams. Scary soundtrack, go! Hurry, Eva! The wolves are nipping at your heels! Make haste, the quicking critics and get by! Groan! Everyone really is this groans! Silence! <laughs> Suddenly, a hand reaches out of the dark and seizes her, the fingers wrapping all the way around her entire waistline. A waistline so small that the Braza de Gul tribe used to call her Bahanim Nagaluzig, which means in English, the pretty one without internal organs. <laughs> You move, you die. The wolves are out tonight. I will kill you myself if you do stir and blubber again. You led the airborne biliousness right to me. I'll never get over this first cruelty. Not in a million years. Not even in 17 chapters. Not even if there's some very reasonable reason why you just spoke to me with such violence. Though I must admit, and only to my diary, that my heart did thrill when he wrapped his fingers around my organist's board. <laughs> and I will never get over her foolishness, though I must admit only in the echoes of my sacred prayers within the caverns where I secretly buried my wife, that my heart did thrill when I wrapped my fingers round her heavenly hollow center and likely fecund womb space. <laughs> <laughs> Grumpy sir, Mick Lipston falls to his knees and begins a prayer so profound that the wolves don't notice that he loads his blunderbuss gun with diamonds of his troubled sleep. He fires at them, boom, and four score and seven wolves die by diamonds. <laughs> score, Mick America, wolves, zero. <laughs> Oh, Merlin's pants, get down, the airborne biliousness comes. Say what? At that, Rick Ripton tackles young Eva to the ground while the biliousness flies overhead. And with the innocence of two corn stalks lying together beneath a great irrepressible wind, they lie together. <laughs> she smells his neck. 
<laughs> it smells of cedar and fresh cut grass and caramel candy. <laughs> The sweet dew of the underworld caverns weeping from his drum-tight pores as he remembers the biliousness that took his matchless wife. His tone! His tone! Now we understand his tone. If only she knew, it would explain a lot! I'll never get over his tone! <laughs> Pox and Botox, you literally gutless sugar baby! <laughs> Saving you, I have acquired a touch of the airborne biliousness. What is airborne biliousness? A complex of symptoms comprising nausea, abdominal discomfort, headache, and constipation, formerly attributed to excessive secretion of bile from the liver. Oh, Barbara Streisand! <laughs> Don't curse so! What do you know about it? What do you know about biliousness? I have amnesia. That's something. <laughs> is it? Well, I guess I don't right remember if it is or not. Though I seem to remember something. Eva tries to remember something, and Nick Lick says something like, The wolves and cacti and biliousness are easily startled, but they will soon be back and in greater numbers. <laughs> Before they depart, Miklik points at the living lump that Eva cradles in her arms and says, What is that? A eunuch. Okay. <laughs> so they walk back to town, at first in silence, and then they start to have a conversation. Eva talks, 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 but Miklik doesn't seem to mind. In fact, Eva says, I'm talking a lot. It is a one-sided conversation. Do you mind? And Miklik says, no. <laughs> and so Eva goes on talking and working out her amnesia one word at a time, though it all sounds like dreams to her, this land of rabbits and jungle. She becomes frustrated. I am frustrated. She has amnesia. I just can't remember who I am. She takes out a pocket mirror and looks into it. Look at me. You may think you see who I really am, but you'll never know me. Every day, it's as if I play a part. Now I see, if I wear a mask, I can fool the world, but I cannot fool my heart. At that moment, something very interesting happens to McLick and his voice. Who is that girl I see staring straight? <laughs> Back at me, when will her reflection show who she is inside? They cherished a moment. <laughs> and continue walking all night into early morning and into the sheep and goat fields of Mick Lick. Sometimes Eva trips and he takes her hand. They smile bashfully at one another and they see all this somehow in the pitch dark. <laughs> <laughs> At one point, when Eva hungers greatly, which is okay to say because I'm referring to food hunger, <laughs> Mick Lick removes a spaghetti dinner from his ration satchel, and they do feast. <laughs> that was quite a moment. <laughs> McLick's 15 gorgeous children are out tending the flocks by night, and they hear a curious sound. You hear that, Brother Zebediah? What? I don't hear nothing, except Par is singing. Fiddlesticks, that's what I'm talking about. When's the last time you heard Par singing? Good point. Yeah, it is. Well, what do we do? Well, if he's singing because he's met a girl off in the dark somewhere, and she reminds him of Mar, and his heart's begun to stir with the love file, then I think we should treat her like the son of a filthy nutcracker when she comes to be the school mom of our little town and live in our house to boot because she has nowhere to go. We her to hate herself and leave because we're all desperately in need of Par's affection and we'll miss our mom terribly and not even a whole mountain of goat fur could replace her who's buried in the ground of the secret cave where Par goes to weep lamentations every night and not the boring kind of lamentations from the Bible but the uncharacteristic interesting Eva's drop on kind? Yeah? Yeah. And this is exactly what the children do. And Eva, new school mom and Miklik tenant, is indeed about to hate herself and run away. Except one night, 
There's a barn fire, and Eva saves a thousand sheep and goats by tying them all together into a gigantic orb of bleating hearts. <laughs> a method used on Kanoshima Island for rounding up rabbits, and it all comes back to her, where she stands guard in the field over the big lamb goat ball, and where McLick finds her and takes her hand, and she says, But when you hold my hand like this, and the lambs are screaming like that. <laughs> I just have to admit that it's all coming back to me. And if we... I remember! I remember the rabbits! Tell me how it's going to be, Nicolette. Tell me about the rabbits. Well, you tell me, my little kitten pickles. <laughs> it's your memory returned. And so she did. People like us, who live on ranches in the imagination of lonely people, we ain't got no sin natures. We get little warm feelings that feel like sin, but then they can be explained away in a couple of weeks. Like your tone. Remember that? <laughs> <laughs> and like the reason my dress is so tight, it's just to support my organless core, so I don't write collapse and without sin natures, we're tru truly the loneliest people in the world. Our kind don't got nobody, but not us. Tell about us now. But not us. Because. Because I got you and. I got you. Babe, we got each other. That's what, that's what gives a hoot in hell about us. Now, tell how it's gonna be. Tell about the rabbits. Occasionally, I will abide rabbits on my property. <laughs> oh, yay! Big ones! Occasionally, I will eat big rabbits prepared by someone near and dear. Oh, I, I guess so. <coughs> now it's your turn, Micklick. Your turn to share something that's a secret. This is the penultimate chapter of our <coughs> love tale, metaphorically speaking. Micklick thinks about it. At this moment, a far-off lightning storm kicks out. It is a heat lightning storm. So their voices conveniently are not interrupted by cloud noise. Heat lightning. Heat lightning. No noise. But rain. But not until their revelations are complete. McLick's face darkens, the goats faint, and the lambs hush. And in the silence of the lambs and goats, <laughs> Micklick says, before I tell you about my mysterious dead wife, I want you to promise that you will marry me. Well, I'm not... Promise. Do we really have to rush on this? I mean, marriage is a... Think of me as your love, as your companion. If it helps, think of me as your meal ticket. <laughs> yes, you are right. I would not be able to eat. Of course I will. Of course, I mean, I don't really have any other options now, do I? <laughs> no. Shake on it. Very well, I will tell you. And now, finally, McLick tells of his wife, Esther Rebecca Ruth Dorcas Tent Peg McLick Lipston. <laughs> oh, virtuous woman Tent Peg. She was worth a lot more than rubies. She was a ruby, a big one. My heart did safely trust in her. I had no need of spoil. Oh, how she used to seek wool and flax and work willingly with her hands before the airborne biliousness did pluck her away and force me in my profound grief to bury her in the earth in such a way that I could visit her undecaying corpse. The only way that was possible, since I couldn't afford a taxidermist, was to shoot her down into monkey gulch mines where bodies do not rot very fast because of the quartz refining process that produces silicone dust and acts on dead flesh like Thompson's water seal, clear multi-surface waterproofer for sun decks and other outdoor wood surfaces. <laughs> Old Esther Rebecca Ruth Dorcas Tempeg. She was like a merchant ship. She brought me food all the way from the kitchen. <laughs> she used to get up in the middle of the night, which was annoying. 
but she did it so she could get ahead on paperwork. She considered fields and bought them, so I didn't have to. She secreted fruit seeds in her sweat. I don't know how that's possible, but she used them to plant vineyards. Oh, she did gird her loins with strength. I used to be known in the gates when I sat amongst my friends of the land all day while she worked her gentle fingers to the holy bone making linen and selling it and delivering girdles and never eating a crumb of the bread of idleness while I was free to do whatever I wanted. Oh, her tongue was the law of kindness. Now marry me, you little missionary, boo-boo, bungalow, rabbit-loving, cuddle chutney. If you choose to have Eva have a mild argument with McLick and then say yes, turn to page 160. If you choose to have Eva turn McLick down and take her chances without him, turn to page 159. <laughs> Page 159. Eva turns McLick down and contracts putrid face disease <laughs> and lockjaw and dies. Eunuch eats her corpse. Except <laughs> him! Ah, page 160. Eva has a mild argument with McLick and then says yes. Marry me, you pooky pumpkin puppy. Well. You swore you would. I know. An oath is a contract binding. I know. You cannot retrench upon it or retract. I will see to it that you are nailed to the metaphorical wall of your broken promises to me. Okay, okay, I'll marry you, Justin Bieber. <laughs> I believe she will. <laughs> and then the rain fell. <sighs> Only rain, no cloud sounds <laughs> whatsoever they were they were married the next morning i need say nothing more for marriage is the great last word and thing of such a tale as this was it is the end that justifies all means even the meanest it is that happy merger of two corporations that used to compete but now form a monopoly that prevents potential competitors from competing in the free market <laughs> It is that egregiously elaborate and dull board game originally published by Parker Brothers in the United States, a game deceptively subtitled The Fast Dealing Property Trading Game. <laughs> Though in marriage there is no property trading, fast or otherwise. And so marriage is not like the game of Monopoly at all, in that the get out of jail free card is ineffectual in real situations. <laughs> So Rig and Eva wed and lived together as man and wife for a long time. The children went on to become a singing group in Europe until they were captured by the evil Protestant Captain von Trapp of the Austro-Hungarian army, who forced them to tempt seditious nuns into renouncing their sacred vows, a game he liked to call the sound of weakness. Eunuch became a funny, wise-cracking martial artist cook in the McLick household. The goats and lambs of the goat-lamb ball that Eva constructed grew together by the sores that formed from their tight quarters and then healed together under the searing rays of a happy sun. And that great rolling mass learned to roll over a coyote or prairie dog and strip it to the bones in a matter of seconds. Before we leave this happy family to make its historic mark upon the cheek of the American facescape, let us listen in on a heartwarming day's end. Good night. Good night, Daddy. Good night, girl. Good night, Mama. Good night, boy. Good night, Mr. and Mrs. McLeod. Good night. Nameless ranch hands who are in the house for some reason. <laughs> Good night, long wandering, unrequited love of my life. <laughs> Good night, Munich. <laughs> Good night, rabbits. Good night, goat lamb ball. <laughs> Good night, dead silicon preserved tent peg mama. Good night. Good night, my merchant ship.
Good night, living, breathing consequence of my promise. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. We're done. <laughs>